Oh, that's a good question. So um, I've been a software engineer, DevOps engineer, system administration sort of a person for, for quite a long time. Uh, so I uh, got my start writing PHP and web, writing web applications and that sort of thing. Um, and then so I spent some time in DevOps and uh, a little bit of time in solutions architecture and that kind of thing. Uh, and then the company I was working for launched a bug bounty program. Um, kind of always been interested in security at least a little bit, uh, even if it was just from the sort of like, wow, hacking is cool sort of a perspective, you know, like um, I'd seen the movie Hackers, of course, you know, it's a big inspiration. Uh, but, you know, also I like to try and break computers and, and figure out how they worked and, and that sort of thing, as well as trying to fix them when I was younger. Um, you know, I think like a lot of people in this industry are going to trouble at school for doing things on the school computers that they shouldn't have done. Um, and, you know, I can remember reading about like DEF CON uh, in um, about 1999 or something like that in some computer magazine and thinking, wow, that sounds super cool. Um, so then uh, much later, so I think around 2017-ish, 2018, the, the company I was working for launched a bug bounty program because they were quite enlightened uh, as a company they decided staff could take part um so uh i saw this as an opportunity because i had a, a wedding that was booked and not yet paid for uh so i thought you know it sounds like a perfect uh match up uh, and, and i was pretty much instantly hooked really um i uh, found something fairly critical fairly quickly uh, and got the big rush of adrenaline that was associated with that um uh, and, and just sort of started there uh, after a while started uh, writing my own tools because uh, software engineering and, and systems administration uh background so that was just kind of how how i approach things i have a problem i'll write a tool to solve the problem um and uh that ended up getting me sort of noticed in, in the community a little bit after I'd been to a couple of live hacking events and that sort of thing. And you know, I showed some other people the tools I'd written, thinking that they were, you know, normal and, and just the kind of thing everybody was doing and then found out, you know, not everyone's doing things the way that I was doing them. So um, uh, that, that worked out pretty well for me. Uh, and that was the thing that allowed me to sort of transition from being... Uh, well, I was at the time a technical trainer, uh, you know, having previously been in software engineering and architecture and that sort of thing, um, into security as an actual career. Um, so, yeah, open source was a was a really big part of it for me. Um, uh, but also, you know, uh, Book Bounty was sort of the, the springboard, really. <laughs> any questions as long as they're relatively related to security yeah probably it seems it's been recorded um <laughs> okay we got a couple of trick questions in the chat so we've got uh what's your thought process like when creating a new tool or script for improving an existing process uh, and or create a new process that should have existed? Kind of heavy question. It's a good question though. I, I like that question. So pretty much everything I've ever written has been written or at least started in, in kind of a proof of concept uh, uh, sort of a way because I encountered a problem while I was trying to do something else. Uh, and, and sometimes that's, you know, it's just trying to interact with an API or it's, um, trying to gather information at scale about a bunch of different bug bounty targets or, or, or something like that. Um, I spend a lot of time working uh, on the Linux command line. Uh, and some things just turned out to be really difficult to do with the tools that I had. Um, so that, that's usually the starting point. So uh, to give an example, um, I was trying to look for uh, one or two particular files across a few thousand different web servers. Uh, and 
there's lots of tools that kind of handle that problem the other way around, where you want to look for thousands of different files or different paths on one server, or at least you know that was the case at the time. Um, but there wasn't really something else that worked the other way around, so I just went and wrote it. Uh, and you know, at, at first it's sort of I'll try and do it in Bash, and then that doesn't work out so well. It needs to be faster, so I'll go and write it in, in Go or, or, or some <laughs> maybe some PHP early on, uh, just because I was sort of more comfortable with with PHP at the time. Um, but yeah, it, it's always driven from an immediate need, uh, and then over time I will either come back to things uh, and use them again and again, and come up with ideas to refine them. Um, in which case they will eventually sort of get their own repository and a readme file and that kind of thing. Um, or, or I won't, and they'll just be a, sort of a one-off thing. Uh, and then they'll sort of live. I have a, a GitHub repository called Hacks that, that has a lot of that sort of stuff in that I kind of wrote, used once, and either didn't work as well as I hoped it would, uh, or I didn't work at all in some cases. Um, or it was just hyper-specific and, and not really useful in that scenario. So um, I, I think that's you know, a, a good approach to deciding what to build because you know it'll be used at least once um, rather than, you know, sort of going, oh, I've got a great idea for a tool that's going to, you know, do everything and solve all the problems. I think whenever I've tried to do anything like that, it's never actually produced anything useful. That answers that question. Uh, I think it's kind of tricky to answer in a way. Um, it depends on what you define as the community. Um, I think uh, the sort of broader technical open source people who use the command line community, I think probably uh, the main one that sticks out to me is uh, a tool called Gram. Uh, so Gram is a tool for turning uh, JSON into something that's greppable. So that's, that's where the name comes from. It's greppable and JSON or rep and JSON smashed together. Um, uh, and that one sticks out because it became uh, real popular. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it passed 10, oh, it passed 10,000 stars on GitHub recently. Um, it's in the default repos for Ubuntu and, and a few other distros. So you can just sort of sudo apt install Grant, which is completely amazing to me. Um, uh, you know, and I think I'm proud of that one because it's just been useful to so many people in so many different uh, industries who, uh, you know, who, whose only real commonality is they have to deal with JSON on the command line. Um, on uh, the book bounty and, and sort of the security side of things, I think there's a few that stick out. So I have a tool called Meg, which I don't actually really use anymore. Uh, it's the one I was referring to earlier on about checking for a few files across a few you know thousands of different servers um that, that one i think sticks in my mind because it was one of the first things i wrote that other people started to really use in in the security side of things um and you know it, it does still have a use um but uh one of my favorite ones is actually a, a real simple tool called unfurl uh, and unfurl is a tool for extracting bits of URLs. Uh, so you can give it a whole bunch of URLs and then say, um, only give me the path or the domain or the TLD or uh, the port or uh, bits of the query string and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, I wrote that because I found myself writing reg regular expressions to pull bits out of domains and, and URLs so often. And it turns out to be a really difficult thing to do because URLs <laughs> turn out to be really, really complicated. Uh, and, uh, you know, it it's just keeps cropping up and being useful in so many um, different uh, situations. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm proud of that one. Uh, also, it's got, I quite like the name as well, Unfell. I thought it was quite clever. Uh, I love a good name, especially if it's a pun. Thank you. 
Good question. Um, I think, uh, as, as I sort of made reference to earlier, the number one thing is to have a problem that you wish to solve. Um, personally, I think it's really, really difficult um, starting with the, um, I guess, the problem, as it were, of I want to write something in a particular language. Right, that's really difficult, or at least I find it really, really difficult. Um, in particular, because actually the hardest thing about programming uh, a lot of the time is nailing down um, the requirements. Uh, like, what does this thing actually need to do? Um, and, and if you don't have an immediate problem to solve, nailing down the requirements is really, really hard. You know, it, otherwise you just find yourself uh, trying to select from such a large uh, potential number of options that it's, it's really difficult. You say, oh, I can write a tool that does this thing. Uh, well, why? Um, so, you know, have, have a problem that you want to solve uh, is probably my main bit of advice. Uh, you know, go through the, the, the Go tour to familiarize yourself with the language, um, but preferably try and come up with something relatively simple uh, even if a tool already exists for it, uh, in particular, if a tool exists that already does, you know, lots of things, but happens to also solve your particular problem, it's okay to sort of solve that sub problem um, uh, and and just yeah, come up with something small. So um, an example I often use uh, when I've taught um, so uh, programming and that kind of thing before in this context is if I have a list of domains and I want to know which ones resolve, um, and I want to do that fairly quickly, that's quite a nice uh, sort of little problem to have because it's something you encounter relatively often in, in the security space and in Book Bounty in particular. Um, but you can solve that in, you know, 10 lines of code uh, or, or fewer if you really try. Um, but then you can also iterate on it and improve it and, and Say, oh well, you know, what if I now add concurrency, and what if I now add options to print out the IP addresses that they resolve as well, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, have a problem to solve, a relatively simple one. Uh, Google for the things you need to know, um, and also uh, so shameless self promotion. I think I did a talk at some point, uh, should be on YouTube, <laughs> where where I write some tools in Go. Uh, covering sort of uh, my general approach to those kinds of things. Oh, um, it's a good question. I think I will try and answer uh, the question about the, the sort of the three vulnerabilities to learn or N top vulnerabilities to learn. Um, but I, I first want to say that's kind of counter to how I think about things um, in terms of uh, book bounty and, and security and I suppose hacking in general, web hacking at least. Um, so you can think, well, I'm going to learn about cross-site scripting, SSRF, and uh, XXE, for example. I, I'm not suggesting those ones, but you know, I'm going to pick some vulnerabilities. I'm going to go and learn about them, and then I'm going to go and, and look for them in different places. You can absolutely do that. Uh, but you will miss things uh, if you do that. Um, and, and the way I approach things when I started out uh, was uh, to kind of go from the opposite way and say, well, I have this web page, this web application, this endpoint, uh, and it does a particular thing. And, and from there, try and figure out what can go wrong. Um, you know, is, if there's input reflected, for example, um, I have to know about cross-site scripting already. Um, so I you know, instantly think of that as a potential problem. Um, 
but I use that as my sort of starting point of well, given this set of given this scenario, what can go wrong? Um, and, and finding out about things just enough to you know to to fulfill a need in that situation. Um, and, and I find that tends to make things sort of the learning process more efficient because I guarantee that way that I get at least one scenario where that information should you know might be useful. Um, Whereas you can go and learn about, oh, what's a, a, a good example? I don't know, XXE or, or something like that. And it turns out the targets you're looking at don't do anything with XML <laughs> at, at, at all. Um, you know, having said that, I think if you're, if you're starting out and you want to take that approach of learning about some vulnerabilities first, I think uh, cross-site scripting is a good one to learn about just because it is so common. Um, and easy to understand and easy to experiment with, and there are a lot of resources uh, and um, sort of practice labs and things like that online that you, you can test with. Um, but also, it's kind of what we call an open box bug. So, you know, you can see the input, and you can see the output, um, and the processing part is kind of, you know, often uh, hidden away from you, kind of the, the middle part. But it, it's a great thing to learn with because you can sort of incrementally see how what you change in the input affects the output in different situations. Um, whereas, you know, some categories of bugs it tends to be uh, sort of all or nothing. You know, you, you don't get that uh, that helping hand. So cross-site scripting is a good thing to learn about. Um, I think SSRF, uh, service of request forgery, is a good thing to learn about, particularly because the way the web is built nowadays is increasingly interconnected with servers talking to other servers. I think it's a really common uh, thing. People tend to you know, build things with microservices or service-oriented uh, architectures these days. So it's a great thing to look out for. And um, oh, what's another good one? I don't know. Um, I think SQL injection is it. It's, it's still around. Most people have sort of got the hang of using prepared statements and <laughs> uh, and preventing that, preventing it as much as possible. Uh, but it's it's still good to learn about, if not just because if you don't know a great deal about how web applications are built already, um, learning about how a web application would use SQL to interact with the database and the kinds of queries it would run and that sort of thing, I think is just generally a, a, a good thing to know about. Um, um, what was the first part of that question? Sorry, I kind of answered it in reverse. Yeah. Um, so the, sh the short answer is no, not really. Um, I think you know like a lot of these things they change uh over time standard device tends tends to apply so things like changing the casing in paths and finding different domains that point to the same application in different places so search engines like census and showdown to try, find, try and find the origins of things if they're exposed um that's something that's worked for me in the past um there are some tools uh i've seen recently appearing for doing sort of 403 bypasses and stuff like that but um generally speaking my advice is uh nothing uh there's nothing state of the art that i know about uh, outside of you know the standard techniques that those tools would apply uh, uh, sorry general steps uh yeah so I mean, there's always things that are applicable to nearly every tool um that i think are important to get right you know regardless of what language it's being written in and from my perspective i'm always thinking about command line tools um and it's easy to sort of dismiss that being on a command line means you don't have to think about the user interface because people associate user interfaces with graphical 
user interfaces. Whereas, you know, how useful a tool is uh, on the command line, so much of that is based around the kind of input it takes and how it takes it and the kind of output it produces. So, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of one of the bits of the Unix philosophy of uh, accepting text streams on standard input and, and outputting text streams on standard output. So I'm always thinking about how a tool is going to interact with other tools, how easy it's going to be to use in different scenarios. And I, and I think that's super important uh, and something that's still kind of missing uh, from from a lot of uh, the, the, a recent, the recent crop of command line tools in, in the security and bug bounty space. Um, I don't want to sort of name any names or anything like that, but um, to me, the inter ability to be interoperable with other tools is like the most important thing about the command line by far. Uh, wow. That's the thing that means I can write a tiny little tool and suddenly that can be really, really useful, even though it's, you know, 15, 20 lines of code, and it does a really small thing. It's how it interacts with other things that's important. Um, but a lot of command line tools are written as you run the command and it outputs some stuff and you look at it right, as a human. And that's kind of great, but that, you know, doesn't really give you much advantage over uh, like a GUI application, which could just, you know, show it in a dialog box. So <laughs> basically every tool that prints an ASCII banner is the very first thing it does. I'm, I'm looking at you <laughs> because if you print an ASCII banner, that means you have not considered piping that tool to grep or piping it to sort or anything like that sort especially um you know or or putting the output into a file or something like that and like you know <laughs> so blind hacker says in the chat you know please include a dash q for quiet but personally I just just don't print the banner don't don't care your default should be output that is useful uh or piping into something else, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, you know, th those are the things that sort of change uh, from tool to tool for me, depending on, on the case as to what of, you know, is the input going to be on, on standard input or is it a file? And if it's a file, is it an argument or is it a list of files and standard in and that kind of thing? But that driving thing is is always, well, what output do I currently have from other tools that might be input to this uh, and how easy is it to use that uh, and then how easy is it to make the output of my tool useful for other things yeah i, I think that's probably as best as i can answer that How do I deal with what, sorry? Yeah. Uh, firstly, uh, a cup of tea, very useful. Um, I've got <laughs> my, at this point, very old keep calm and automate mug uh, that my old boss got me. Uh, so, you know, but genuinely, a cup of tea, a rest, a walk, that kind of thing, uh, maybe sometimes a sleep, uh, can be uh, uh, highly beneficial. Uh, one of the other things I will sometimes do is just give up. <laughs> That's the answer you're never supposed to give to those kinds of questions, right? That's not very motivational. Um, but, you know, very occasionally the answer is, oh, actually, this problem is significantly harder to solve than I thought I hadn't realized. You know, it, it, this is like a PhD's worth of work. That's happened to me a couple of times. Um, but my other uh, advice in that situation is to be hyper aware of what gets called the XY problem. So if you're not familiar, uh, the XY problem is where you're trying to solve problem X and you encounter sub problem Y. Uh, so you ask people about sub problem Y. Uh, and you might get a solution, you might not. Um, but in the situation where you don't get a solution or it turns out to be very difficult, um, you should always, always go back to problem X and ask about that instead. 
um, or, or research that because it might be that there is another route to a solution uh, that you have not considered and does not involve proper subproblem play uh, at all. Um, and, and sometimes that can be, you know, it manifests itself in obvious ways, uh, and in other ways it can be really, really subtle. Um, so um, I'm trying to think of a specific example for you. Um, but there's definitely times in the past where I've been hacking away, trying to sort of figure out, well, how can I verify this particular thing, um, like before I do a network call or something like that. You know, I need to verify this system's alive before I contact. How am I going to do that efficiently, and, and so on and so forth. And then it turns out it's really difficult. But then when I think about it some more, I think, well, the original problem. It turns out actually I can just ignore it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm just going to attempt to anyway, but I'm going to add some um, concurrency or, or something to make sure that my attempt is non-blocking, and I'm going to deal with fa just deal with failures gracefully or silently. Um, so uh, that kind of thing crops up quite uh, remarkably often. Um, the other thing that I would say is sometimes I find it useful to step outside of what I'm currently working on and work on just the subprom. Um, I think it's pretty common in programming to quite quickly get to a state where the project you're working on is quite big and has lots going on, and it's doing lots of things. And then you encounter some problem that just seems insurmountable. Um, and often in those situations, I will stop and just create a completely from scratch new project or um, uh, just completely by itself uh, and try and work on the absolute minimum representation of that problem as I possibly can without all of the complexities and overheads of everything else that already exists. Um, and uh, sometimes that's kind of how, how I end up with like the real small tools as well. I'm trying to do something in one place and, and go over and solve it somewhere else. And then at, at the end of that, sort of realize, well, actually, this is a useful standalone tool by itself. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, I think Im imposter syndrome is a big deal in the security community and in tech in general, especially, um, because there are a lot of incredibly high performing people, or at least they seem that way uh, outwardly. Um, and there's some like, pithy sound bites and things that I think are, are applicable, like, uh, you know, don't compare your outtakes to someone else's highlight reel and, and, and all that kind of thing. It's really easy to focus on the things you can't do versus the things other people can. Um, that, that's for sure. Uh, but one of the things that I um, have, you know, <laughs> struggle with myself uh, and have to really try and uh, force myself to, to focus on is it's okay to have a niche and, and to be good at that niche. I think it's also important to have you know, a, a sort of a broad but still shallow uh, base of skills so that you get have more options when you encounter problems. Um, but, you know, to give you an, an example, uh, I've been thinking of <laughs> so something that kind of weighs on me is I'm not a very good hacker <laughs> uh, or, or bug bounty hunter even. Um, and, and I think nothing exemplifies that more for me than when people come to me and say, uh, oh, thank you for writing this tool. I used it and got loads of bounties. And I'm like, well, I didn't. 
<laughs> no, I, I wrote it. I didn't get loads of bounties. What's going on? Uh, and it's really easy in that situation to think, to focus on the fact that they're you know a, a better hacker or a better bug bounty hunter than me. Um, but the thing I should be focusing on is that they couldn't write the tool. You know, that's the part that I had that they didn't. Um, and and that's okay. There are too many things to learn about in security, for sure. There's always going to be someone who knows more than you about just about everything. Uh, but one of the things you can do uh, is to be kind of okay at lots of things and then very good at two or three things. Um, uh, and chances are that you are world class in the combination of those three things, if that makes sense. You're probably not the best in the world at any one of them. But when the situation arises that those three, two or three skills come together, that's when you get to be world class. Uh, and it's much easier to, to do that than to try and be the best at any one thing. And certainly trying to be the best at everything because you never can be. Um, Else. Yeah, um, imposter syndrome. It's. It, I don't think it ever really goes away, um, uh, and if it does go away, that's the point at which you should be concerned. Uh, you know, uh, try and use it as a uh, a tool to drive you to an extent, but also you know don't don't stress it too much. It's easy to say, oh, you know, just don't stress about it. That's not how it works at all. Um, but uh, you're never alone, uh, is the point. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of these things always tend to be situational, situationally dependent. Um, I have a few techniques I have used in the past that have worked. So one of which is to pick on some kind of unique looking copy in the web application, a bit of text or something like that, and to search for it on search engines like Census and Shodan and, and that kind of thing and see if there's any other IPs that came up with that, you know, that same piece of text. Uh, sometimes quite tricky picking something that's sort of unique enough. Um, you know, uh, other things are occasionally, as the result of malformed URLs and things you will get, uh, redirect with location headers that specify IP addresses and that kind of thing. Uh, it's just I would categorize that as throw junk data at it and see what happens, um, which is you know occasionally a, a useful technique. Um, but the other thing is you know to realize that a lot of the time you're just not going to. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the things that uh, is really difficult to learn the balance for is when to give up. <laughs> Which, you know, again, that's not, that's not what you're supposed to say, is it? It's not, it's not very motivational, but oftentimes that server is not publicly accessible and there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, so, um, you know, don't, don't spend uh, an inordinate amount of time trying to find something that might not be findable. Um, to, yeah, uh, what else? So you can also go sort of the other way around that. Again, depends on the size of the company and that kind of thing. Sometimes a company will have an autonomous system associated with them or a particular range of IPs. So have a look at the all of the domains and subdomains for that company, see what IPs they resolve to. You might find in some certain situations that some are behind WAFs, some are not. You know, some are behind Cloudflare or Akamai or, or, or whatever. Uh, and others aren't. And for those that aren't, you know, where are they hosted? What IP range are they in? Maybe have a look in those IP ranges and send 
the host headers that you are interested in. Um, so let's say you're looking for the server behind example.com. Um, and it's a Cloudflare IP address it resolves to, right? So uh, in, in an attempt to find the origin server, I might go and look at uh, mail.example.com and admin.example.com and see what IPs they resolve to. Um, and I could make HTTP requests to those IPs and other IPs in that range with the host header of example.com and, and see what I got. Because um, you know that that's one of the things to be aware of is that servers react differently depending on the host header that you give them um, for non-HTTPS. For HTTPS, also uh, ensure that you have uh, things configured right to use SNI uh, as well, server name uh, identification, because a lot of servers will give you a completely different response if you give them a different domain as part of SNI. Um, yeah, uh, I think those that about sums up the the things I would try. Um, again, yeah, be mindful of looking for things that might not exist. Um, oh, certainly not that many. Um, I think largely because I tend to sort of write things just in time. <laughs> so, you know, like as a problem arises, I'll, I'll, I'll try and write at least something uh, that comes up. I think there's a few ideas I've had in the past where I didn't really do anything with it. Um, I still don't have something for, uh, ooh, how do I explain it? Uh, so often I, I, I want to take, you know, a few, let's say thousands or tens of thousands of, of domains or, or host names, uh, and then send, say, uh, one base request and then two slightly modified requests and uh, have a way to quickly identify things that behaved oddly <laughs> in the response, sort of like an anomaly uh, detection kind of a thing. So like Burp Suite's uh, backslash powered scanner has some stuff in it that, that kind of does something like that, but it doesn't quite work the way that I wanted that I want it to. Um, uh, and I'd, I'd like to write something that does that, but part of the problem is I haven't worked out what the user interface should look like yet, right? Uh, like I say, no, the, the most important thing is, for me, about a tool is often how it interacts with other tools, uh, and I haven't worked out how that would interact with other tools yet. Uh, so that, that's one thing I would like to write. Um, oh, what else? I'd still find myself sort of missing some kind of target management system that works the way I want it to. Uh, I've had a couple of attempts at, at, at writing something, and I've I spent time working with uh, Recon NG, uh, which is great um, and, and does a lot of things right, but doesn't quite handle some of the cases that I want and because I'm not really a Python person. Um, I mean, I don't really write Python. I'm obviously not part snake. Uh, you know, that, that means I find it difficult to sort of add the features I would want to that tool. Um, and it's, again, doesn't really interoperate with other tools that well. That's the kind of the thing that's missing. So some kind of project management, <laughs> target management system that, that fulfills my needs is something I'd like. Um, you know, I currently use text files for everything, uh, and it kind of works okay. But it suffers with its inability to handle um, relationships between data, 
uh, and things like that. So it's really easy to have a list of domains and a list of host names with schemes. And then, you know, I go and request those and have HTTP responses and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's quite difficult to sort of then say, oh, well, um, you know, which, uh, you know, when did I make this request or uh, where did I get this piece of data from? Is another thing that that's kind of missing. You lose a lot of metadata that way. Um, so, you know, something that solves those problems for me in a nice way that's still Unix friendly. I'd really like to crack that someday. Cool. Um, so I'm a big fan of Burp Suite as a sort of do everything uh, kind of a thing. Um, it, it's quite a departure from how I usually do things. And it sort of took me it took me longer than I should have done to get started using Burp Suite because I found it kind of intimidating early on because I didn't know what it all did. Um, but you know, it's it's industry standard for a reason. <laughs> Um, quite like uh, uh, FUF, FFUF, uh, for brute forcing and things. But again, it sort of, it, it you know, it does suffer from that sort of lack of interoperability with, with other tools a little bit. But it has a lot of features, which kind of makes up for that. Um, I have sort of a, a general category of tools I really like, rather than specific tools. Although I, I can probably name a couple, which is tools where I wrote. Um, a I, I wrote like a proof of concept tool, or so kind of like an alpha quality thing, because I needed it there and then, and did a so-so job of implementing it. And then someone else has seen it, liked the idea, had their own ideas, or spotted deficiencies in it, and they've written their own version. <laughs> uh, and then I don't have to maintain the original anymore. I really like it when that happens. That's one of one of my. Uh, favorite things about uh, open source uh, is when someone writes something I wrote, but better, and now I don't have to deal with it. I could just get to use it. I'm not super familiar with Firefox Buster, so I, I can't really give um, a good um, answer to that because I haven't played with it enough to know. Um, but uh, I'll add it to my list of things to to have a play with. I think I, I'm generally speaking pretty guilty of finding something that does what I want and not pushing much harder for, uh, you know, even though the, there might be something that's and 20, 15 percent better. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll give it a try, and maybe I can post my answer on Twitter in a few weeks or so. Oh. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the main thing is that the approach of Cosmos aligns with what I've been trying to do all along with the tools that I've been writing. Um, so there's sort of a, a, a couple of approaches to security products, right? You've got sort of fully automated scanners, and then you've got penetration testing. Um, and the way I sort of saw tools is as a thing to be used by humans, like outside of, you know, pressing go. Um, things like that are always 
you know, they're very impressive. They can be very useful. They save a lot of people time, but they struggle on the creativity part. Um, and, and I always really liked the tools that sort of gave humans superpowers rather than, uh, you know, trying to do everything. Um, and, uh, you know, a few years ago, I met um, Rob Reagan, who's a uh, principal researcher at Bishop Fox. Uh, and he stole a line from somebody else, but but said it to me, and, and it really resonated with, resonated with me, which was, uh, we're trying to build Iron Man, not Ultron. Uh, and, and I thought that was a really great way uh, to sum it up uh, of, you know, I, I'm trying to make humans the best they can be, not trying to build something to replace humans. Um, because, you know, the, the fully automated systems, again, they have their use. Um, uh, and I think uh, will continue to get better. But there are always going to be categories of bugs they don't find or can't find, especially not with a decent rate of false positives. And uh, and they certainly generally don't discover new and, and novel techniques. Um, so, uh, yeah, also tons of smart people. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm a glutton for learning stuff. Uh, and sometimes the fastest way to learn is to ask somebody who knows. Um, uh, and there's lots of those kinds of people. So, uh, that, that was definitely a good bonus. But yeah, I think it sort of aligned with my philosophy on how security should be done. Oh, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I, I'm good enough at them to call them habits, but I have some things that I, I try and do. Um, one of which is um to try and do things when i need them and not to sort of think oh it'd be really great if this thing existed <laughs> uh to just go oh well you know I'll, i'm gonna stop right now and, and make that thing um uh and it's it's often a trade-off you know there's a, i think there's a famous xkcd comic that sort of charts the sort of time doing something versus the time automating something um but I think if you uh, if you get good at good enough at, at, at building things, then you can do things remarkably quickly. Um, <laughs> I have an example of that actually uh, at a live hacking event. A couple of people came up to me and said, "Hey, Tom, do you have a tool that does this? Because we're trying to do this thing and we haven't found anything that does it." And I said, "No, um, but we can build it." Uh, and I think it. I, I took note of the time, and I think it took about forty-five minutes or so, you know, to have something that did uh, what they need. Um, whereas, you know, the, the easy thing to do there would have been say, "Oh no," but you know, by the next live hacking event or something, maybe we should talk about this sometime and, and do it. Uh, I think it's really easy to have an hour-long meeting about something that would have taken you thirty minutes to do. <laughs> so, uh, trying trying to avoid that is is one of the things I try to do. Um, uh, the other thing I try to do is um, not ignore the obvious stuff. Um, and, and I'm not very good at this, uh, but I know someone who is, uh, and it works for them time and time again. There's a, a a hacker and book bounty hunter called uh, Sam or ZLZ uh, goes by. And um, some of the bugs I've seen him find are ridiculously simple because he tried something that nobody else even bothered to think of. They were like, they maybe thought of it. And were like, no, <laughs> that's never going to work. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time you'd be right. It won't work. 
But he keeps trying them. And every now and again, he finds the most incredible stuff uh, that way. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it's... I always try and remind myself of, you know, what would Sam, when I'm stuck, what would Sam do in this situation? Or like, he'd just start trying, you know, the, the, the most ridiculous stuff. Like, we were trying to find some... Um, we had a, a, a server once where we could find nothing on it at all. Like, there's no interesting endpoints that we could make do anything interesting. Or, and he just he just tried to put an HTTP put with a random file name and, and body, and it uploaded. <laughs> I I never would have bothered. Uh, so uh, I try not to forget the simple stuff. He's been in the news recently because Google sent him a quarter of a million dollars accidentally. Uh, ooh, so uh, this passes the um, what what I think is the nickname rule, which is you're not supposed to come up with your nickname yourself. It's supposed to be given to you because you know other otherwise people try and come up with things that sound a bit too cool. Um, so I this is a really stupid story. Uh, I used to work at a company uh, called. Frog Trade, uh, who made virtual learning environment software for schools. Uh, I was a, a developer there. And um, we had uh, somewhere in the office a toy frog that made a noise and it went om nom 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 nom. Uh, and it was a common noise to hear in the, the dev team area. Uh, and as a result of hearing that, one of the uh, other devs, Chris and me, Tom nom 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 nom. Um, but I thought it was a little bit too long, uh, too many noms for me. Uh, although I do love to eat, so it's quite fitting uh, in that way. Uh, and I realized Tom nom nom dot com was available to register, so I went and bought it straight away, uh, and that kind of stuck with me from there. Yeah, like I'm Tom, but everyone calls me Big Man. Uh, no. Yeah. Oh, uh, zero. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I spent my entire life being a terrible study uh, of things. Um, like the tool building, I tend to find things out as and when I need to know them. Um, because otherwise, I just feel kind of directionless. Um, like, I've tried. I really tried. I've gone, I want to know more about uh, XXC. <laughs> Coming up as an example again. I'm going to go and read about it. Uh, and I can go, like, read a blog post or two or something and then go, all right, I've read about that now. Uh, but I don't really retain the information unless I'm using it straight away. And then the only way to sort of use it straight away in that situation is to like do something quite contrived to come up with it. So um, I... Uh, yeah, so I, nearly everything I learn is I need to know about this thing now. I've got a problem to solve, something to debug, something that's not working, um, or, or something like that. I'm going to go and find the specific part in the RFC that tells me what I need to know, right? Um, and I will read 
I, I will follow tangents from that often. You know, I sort of very rarely have I got to the bottom of a Wikipedia page without having several tabs open on other subjects, which I will then skim about. But I won't read about them in depth. I, I think about it as um, right. the thing that politician got uh, made fun of for saying, but I absolutely agree with you. There's known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, and, and I think one of the most efficient uses of your time in this day and age where we have the internet and quick access to information is shoveling as many unknown unknowns into known unknowns as possible, right? Because known unknowns is also, uh, could be described as stuff you can Google for. Um, where, you know, previously you didn't even know to look for it. Uh, so a pretty common thing for me is uh, be presented with a problem and think, oh, I read about X that might be applicable in the situation. I don't know enough to actually use it, but I know a, a little bit about it. <laughs> you know, I moved it into the known unknowns, uh, and then I can go and Google and learn about it and, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah. Oh, um, so I will preface this with a disclaimer, which is I am the wrong person to ask. Um, I have had incredible luck uh, over the years where uh, I think I've had two interviews where I did not get the job or did not get an offer. Um, and one was when I was a teenager and I was applying in some shop or other, um, and they just hired someone else. Um, and there was one other one but so you know if, for the most part i don't actually have <laughs> that much experience interviewing because it tended to go i had the interview and, and, and got the job um <laughs> which sounds very lucky uh with with bishop fox um again i think it was non-typical so i actually uh tried to go and work for bishop fox a, a few years ago and there were some issues with me being uh, in a different country, not actual problems. It was just like paperwork being paperwork, basically. And I ended up going somewhere else, um, you know, not through any sort of any real fault of anybody. It was just just a pain. Um, and then when I came back, I had a chat with some people and they sort of said, well, we're not going to interview you again because we've already done it. <laughs> we, we already did it a couple of years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, my, my experience there w was very, very good. Um, but knowing the people, and in particular people who, who do hiring and, and technical interviews and that kind of thing, they're good people. Uh, and, and they want to know um, how you are at your best, um, which I think is probably the most important thing in hiring. I've worked with people in the past who, you know, were a big fan of, of finding a gotcha or something like that. Or they wanted to know, does the candidate know about all the things that I know about, right? <laughs> Which I think is the exact opposite of what you should be trying to do when you're hiring. Uh, and I think Bishop Fox does a pretty good job of that side of things, sort of looking for people that know things that we don't know already, um, because like they're the most useful people to hire. Um, a slightly disjointed answer, sorry. Uh, again, I sort of 
I find it difficult to draw on my own experience with this because I was sort of I you know been a software engineer for a de for a decade before I started I'd already done security training and knew about different vulnerabilities and so on and so forth um I think from what I have seen other people struggle with I would say don't be afraid to just start um you can go looking for things um and, and you know it's quite likely you probably won't find anything for a while um but look at things uh, and try and research and find out what they are and what they do and and why um whether that be you know web applications or mobile applications or whatever it is that you are interested in i think it's useful to learn a little bit about how things are built by building them um but you know don't don't feel like you have to go and uh you know learn two different programming languages and and build full like fully fledged applications before you can get started but also don't get lost on you know a hack the box and that kind of thing and thinking oh you know i'll do two more of these and then i'll start hacking for real <laughs> you know I, I, you can just stay there forever because there's so much stuff to learn um having said that uh i'm a big fan of uh port swigger labs um they are free resources that are very well documented i think they're very well designed labs covering a wide range of different vulnerabilities um you know that everything's sort of backed up by documentation and blog posts and things that explain exactly what's going on um i think it's a good idea to have a, a reasonable idea of sort of networking and how computers talk to each other uh, at least a little bit um you know the, the things that comprise if you're looking at web stuff a web application like what's the difference between HTML and JavaScript and CSS and, and, and what do they do and why and so on. Um, but I, I think, as I've said a few times already, you know, the common thing for me has always been I encounter a thing and I learn about it then um, rather than trying to speculatively learn about things, if that makes sense. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, uh, point thoughts. Uh, just to hark back to probably like the imposter syndrome -y, uh, sort of a question a little bit uh, and say, don't be afraid to have a niche. I think it took me longer than I would have liked to be comfortable in my own niche of tooling and, and that kind of thing, even though that meant admitting that I wasn't the best person at using my own tools that was a hard, you know that that's a hard thing to admit to myself um but it but it felt kind of freeing to finally do so uh and sort of go i'm never going to be the best at this other stuff or the best hacker or, or anything like that um but uh i can try and be better at the things i enjoy uh, i think that, that that's the main thing for me Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for all the good questions. Cool. Have a good day, everyone.